welcome to our very special 2018 in review and 2019 perspectives, advice and insights. We're doing this both as video and podcast, and we hope it to be a very informative and and uh, uh, enlightening uh, opportunity for you. <clears throat> there is a uh, written white paper, so to speak. Uh, we have it. You can print a PDF online at marketepicurean.com. We also, if you email us, can send to you a bound booklet version uh, filled with charts and, and so forth to kind of lay out. It's, you know, almost... 30 pages, but very readable, very understandable. Um, and I say that as the person who wrote every single word of it myself. Um, I really do want it to be a piece that almost anyone could read. Certainly clients of ours could read at, at whatever level of an investor they may be and get an understanding of what happened in the markets and not just the stock market, but the overall investing universe in 2018 and then uh, get a real good feel for the lay of the land in 2019, the new year that we've just embarked upon. <clears throat> the investment opportunity in 2019 is filled with potential tailwinds and opportunities and filled with potential risks and, and headwinds. And I think that what we want to get into today is unpack what both sides of that equation look like and provide you some conclusions as to what we're doing on behalf of our client capital as stewards of such here at the Bonson Group. Let me just start off with a basic kind of numerical rundown of what 2018 represented. Um, you know, December is part of the calendar, and so the fact of the matter is it does us no good to say what the market had done all year to November 30th and treat December as some sort of separate, you know, moment in time. But the fact of the matter was that it really was a very different experience throughout 2018 um, versus the way things ended uh, based on December, where the Dow and the S&P dropped over 9% in the final month of the year. You know, and actually had been down for much further than even that. They kind of came back a bit at the very end of the year. Well, you ended up with a S and P 500 down 6.2 percent on calendar year 2018 on a price basis, and uh, Dow Jones da uh, down a little over 5 percent, and both those indexes were up roughly 3 percent going into the final month of the year. Um, so that's how severe the carnage was in the month of December. Um, in terms of the uh, Rest of the world, let's stick with stock markets. Europe uh, didn't fare better. It fared actually significantly worse, where you had Germany down 21%, France down 11 Spain down 15 uh, The United Kingdom, uh, Britain's market was down 12% on the year, although it had been even up until the month of October, and, and that's when we exited our position, and it literally dropped all 12% in the very final month of the year as uh, a lot of the Brexit turmoil picked up again. So Europe was no place to hide at all, down mid-teens on average, significant double-digit losses there. Emerging markets actually fared better on a relative basis in the fourth quarter, um, and particularly December but we're down on the year 15%, probably as far as the major asset classes go, the worst performer. When you look at the fourth quarter of emerging markets, it was down 7.5%, and you had the Dow and the S&P down about 13% in the fourth quarter, um, but on the year, emerging markets fared even worse. So in equity markets, there was no real place to hide um, I think it was the single country of Qatar that had the best performing index on the year. Um, then you go into bonds, though, and this is, again, a really fascinating story, and I'm going to be elaborating on this in a moment. But the bond market, there's an index called what we used to call the Lehman Ag. It's now the Barclays Aggregate Index. It's treasuries, agency mortgages, and investment-grade corporates. 
And so there's no frills in it. It isn't including high yield and emerging markets debt. It's just your vanilla bonds, treasuries, corporates, agencies. And it was down all year, 11 months of the year. And then in uh, December, as bond yields dropped so much, it rallied dramatically and it ended up on the year 0.1%. So just barely by a hair up on the year. And so it ended up avoiding that thing I had been talking about a couple weeks ago of both the stock market and bond market being down in the same year. That it hadn't happened for a treasury bond and the S&P 500 to be down in the same year since 1969. And there's a reason. It's very hard to do. And it didn't happen again last year. So we're looking at 50 years now. Um, there's a, uh, a lot I'm going to unpack about that. Uh, and what it means to investors, what we learn from it, what we think about it going forward. But essentially, the bond market spent most of the year slightly down, and at the very end of the year, barely got in positive territory. But that rally that took place in municipal bonds in December and treasury bonds, uh, it really did help to offset some of the equity market drop that was taking place. In other words, it was just asset allocation doing what it does, different asset classes zigging and zagging to kind of neuter the volatility of another one. And, and it actually ended up being a pretty favorable proposition for investors. Um, what other uh, market indexes do we want to talk about? I, I, I think there, there is a chart I lay out for you in the um, yearly summary that is fascinating to me, and it frankly was a surprise. I didn't know it until we were constructing this data. Um, last year, the best performing asset class in 2017, two, uh, the year before, was plus 37%. That was emerging markets. The worst performing asset class of like the major categories of asset class investing was uh, commodities were up 1% or 2%. So the worst was plus two, the best was plus 37, and everything else was in between. A lot of 10 to 20 percent performers in 2017, but no major asset class negative. In 2018, the best performing major asset class were bonds at zero percent. Basically, break even with every other asset class in negative territory from emerging markets at negative 15, U.S. equities at negative six, international equities at negative, you know, 12, 13, 15, depending on what you're looking at. Uh, commodities down, real estate down, gold down. So there was no major asset class in positive territory besides bonds that effectively break even. The point I'm making is that uh, it was not a year of a bloodbath like a 2008 where an awful lot of things were down 20, 30, 40 percent. And yet it was not a year where there were um, huge dispersions or opportunities. Something's up 20, something's down 20. It was just a year in which virtually every asset class um, was in a slightly negative territory, dramatically negative in fourth quarter on the whole year, slightly negative. And you could look at it from one of two ways. The fact of the matter is stock market had been up nine years in a row. 2011 and 2015, the U.S. stock market was basically flat. It was positive with dividend. It was negative by a hair without dividend. But still, it wasn't a negative total return. And then now you finally have your first negative year in nine years, and it was down 6%. Uh, so, you know, things can get a lot worse than that. And yet, it wasn't like we were getting these outstanding returns from other asset classes to offset. Now, the alternative space bode very well in 2018. And of course, by definition, alternatives, it depends what alternatives you're invested in. It's not a monolithic story. I, I reiterate one of the most important investment truisms I ever learned in our market Epicurean piece when I remind you that alternative is not an asset class, it's an asset manager. It depends how that manager, that strategy that has a lot of particularity to it may perform. But when you're getting 5 6 7% positive returns in various alternatives while your stocks are down 5 6 7%, that 10 to 12% outperformance does a lot to buffer that, that downside and kind of create a smooth defect. So, so it, was a, it was a year in which asset allocation did what it was supposed to do. And there was a period of time earlier in the year where bonds and stocks were heavily correlated 
And when your stocks are dropping, your bonds are dropping too, and it wasn't you know, creating that zig and zag effect that investors call on and rely on and need during periods of turmoil uh, that asset allocation is designed to do. And, and yet for a full year, in particular in the fourth quarter when things really got hairy, um, it, it very much worked. And particularly for those you know, at the Bonson Group, we're very big believers philosophically and the way we execute around the alternative asset class, asset world, and that was something that did very well. I will say that uh, 2018, we had laid out a number of forecasts about the year, kind of themes and ideas, and it's a really odd year because some of the things that I kind of believed would happen, it's unbelievable how true they ended up being. And yet they didn't all function just exactly within the perfect calendar window of 2018, meaning we talked about that rotation from growth to value in the days of high beta tech stocks, these so-called FANG stocks, having their uh, day in the sun come to an end. And, and that was something we wrote about a year ago. And, and the fact of the matter is for about nine months, it wasn't just wrong. It was violently wrong in the sense that the, the high-powered FANG stocks continued rallying up, in some cases, triple-digit percentages, like over 100% in some cases, 20 40 60%, big movements higher. And yet um, it became very, very accurate by the end of the year as that collective body of stocks literally dropped some names 20 some names 50 but you know blended together about 40 percent which is the exact kind of drawdown that we really seek to to avoid as much as we can and and so you that, that theme ended up being very accurate now to say that the rotation from growth area to value is it which is growth has been outperforming value so dramatically for so long To say that that has actually come to fruition is really difficult to rationalize in 2018 because, again, for nine months of the year, growth far outperformed value. But definitely in that fourth quarter, you see values outperformance over growth moving uh, really substantially. Some great charts to this effect in our paper. So um, kind of a mixed result there. It was very true at the end, not very true earlier in the year. We talked a lot about small cap as a theme in 2018, believing that there was a whole segment of smaller capitalization companies that would not be as affected by a strengthening dollar. They tend to be less global and multinational players and that were kind of underappreciated beneficiaries of reduced corporate tax rates. And again, it was something that not only ended up being true, but it was far more true than I would have uh, anticipated for a significant part of the year. At one point, um, small cap was up well into the teens, um, 12, 13, 14 percent on the year when the S&P was only up five, six or seven. But then uh, when everything fell apart in the fourth quarter, it isn't just that small cap gave up that relative outperformance. It gave up its absolute performance and it ended the year down 12 percent. So you basically had a bear market ensue in the Russell 2000 as it went from, let's call it, plus 10 to minus 12, uh, over 20-point swing at the end of the year um, in the small cap space. Um, Companies that are – we're going to talk about why that is in a moment. So I I think I've I've tried to paint a picture for you as to what took place in 2018. An awful lot of the benefits of corporate tax reform had been priced into the market coming into the year, and you had an 18 or 19 times multiple in the S&P. The earnings outperformed expectations, and yet the multiple dropped more, the price-to-earnings ratio dropped more than the actual earnings growth itself. And so you ended up with a negative total return. Um, what, would, what caused it? It's really primarily two things. It was not a valuation story. You right now have a forward multiple coming into 2019. You know, stocks have actually been rallying into the new year. But coming into the new year, you had a forward multiple in the S&P 500 of about 14.7. Okay, let's call it 14 and a half times earnings. Very low relative to where we've been and lower than our historical average of roughly 16. Um, so it was not a valuation crash. We, we, we were slightly over full value historically and we became slightly under full value. 
um, it was primarily the evaluation compression around the headwinds of monetary policy and the trade war. And you see time and time again, rate sensitive stocks, um, high PE stocks that are relying on that kind of high valuation, which re implies a low rate in the market and high amount of liquidity in the economy um, getting punished at late in the year. As the Fed perhaps went a bit further in their tightening than the market expected they would, and certainly than the market wanted them to do. I will quickly make this comment. I do not believe that the Fed necessarily was wrong to have raised rates in the year. Um, the Fed needs to maintain credibility, and if they get viewed as a kind of tool of the stock market, it becomes difficult for them to have policy gravitas when they need to have it. Um, I happen to believe they are a tool of the stock market ultimately, but last year they went by far the furthest they have at trying to prove they weren't. Um, ultimately, I think that the market's response to Fed tightening to a stricter monetary environment um, had a lot more to do with the balance sheet of the Fed. What I mean is all of that quantitative easing they had done, that they sort of accelerated the pace of their unwinding of it. I myself was pretty surprised at how little the market responded, actually responded favorably, when they first began quantitative tightening. But as I wrote about quite a bit, they were only doing 10 to 20 billion a month, and it was just such a snail's pace that the market took it in stride. They accelerated that pace up to 50 billion a month by the end of the year. And, and because of the nature of our leveraged corporate economy right now, I believe the market was unable and is right now unwilling to absorb this much liquidity coming out of the economy. And so the theme that we're sort of talking about is that the Fed got the patient very, very, very uh, used to this medicine. And the corporate America responded in kind. I don't believe it. they went on any kind of borrowing binge. Their ratios are not absurd, but they brought them back up to full levels. We were at, you know, two times leverage ratios. Now we're two and a half times. It's a 25% increase in, in leverage, meaning debt to assets on the balance sheet of corporate America. You see an awful lot of increase in middle market lending, an awful lot of increase in direct bank lending, lever loan market. And so those higher rates and less degree of reserves in the banking system, it's a form of just taking away from the punch bowl what you had put in before. And the Fed needs to do it. The Fed wants to do it. But they, they are likely being told by the market, you just have to do it slower. You have to kind of take a bit of a pause. And, and a lot of what happens in 2019, I think, is going to come down to that. The big rally we've had in equities so far in 2019 is a byproduct of the Fed seemingly blinking last Friday and saying we need to kind of just, you know, take this slow. So uh, the, the Fed um, definitely by the end of the year and their seemingly uh, aggressive stance towards undoing a lot of what they had done in a very dovish monetary policy, a very loose monetary policy, was a big part of why I think the market finally began revolting. But then the other element was the trade war that we talk about, the amount of businesses that are right now not investing in new projects, that are hitting the break around certain endeavors, that are seeing their order books slow down, decreasing durable goods, capital goods, uh, inventory buildup, uh, ISM manufacturing, all slowing down to the second half of the year after that trade war began to accelerate, higher tariffs being imposed both ways on exports and imports, and a lot of question mark as to how much worse this could get. A little pause was put on it uh, by policymakers in both the Trump administration and in China near the end of the year. They're in the course of trying to work some things out going into a alleged March um, 2019 deadline. And, and it's very possible this becomes a tailwind into markets in 2019. But to set the table for why 2018 was unable to fully reflect in stock market prices and at risk assets more broadly 
the really positive things happening with GDP growth, with low unemployment, with, with um, the fact that corporate earnings have grown so much uh, behind the corporate tax reform. I think that all that good news is legit. All that good news is real. A lot of it had already been priced in. The market is a discounting mechanism. And then it ran into the wall of the Fed and the China trade war and is right now having to sort of sort through where it goes from here. I had thought we'd stay between a little period uh, in the Dow, 24 and 26,000, unable to get much meaningfully past 26, probably not likely to go below 24. And then we broke that in December and the, and the selling kind of accelerated. It's now come back up and we see where things go. I'm hesitant to say that we're back to 24,000 now uh, because again, the volatility had been so high, it could flip in a minute. Let me use that as a segue to a comment on the 2018 volatility, and then I'm going to get into our path for 2019. So essentially, the final comment on 2018 needs to be, and this is one of our forecasts from last year that was by far the most accurate, whether or not it was helpful to you or not, you can decide. But the idea that the days of low volatility were over obviously became very true. Now, you know, a lot of people are going to take that to mean, oh, all of a sudden 2018 became hyper volatile. That isn't accurate. Uh, fourth quarter was hyper volatile. December was hyper volatile. But listen, the fact of the matter is that we had brutally abnormal low volatility in 2017. There were eight days in the calendar year of 2017, eight days where the market was up or down over 1%. There were nine days in December of 2018 where it was up or down over 1%. There were 64 days in the whole calendar year. So you had eight times more days, intraday volatility of that up and down movement. Um, the, the VIX was up 130% in the year. It was just a normalization, and yet really the average annualized daily volatility, the standard deviation in the market, I'll spare you a lot of the fancy terminology, but it was, it was just a very little bit above its normal historical average. Um, and so we, we really kind of had a restoration of normalization in the volatility of the market and that, that enhanced volatility, uh, normalized volatility is a byproduct of the Fed being less available to offer an assist to markets when we were living in this period of financial repression of, of 0% interest rates and, and, and quantitative easing and all that. The December volatility was certainly higher than normal, and it was painful in the sense that most of the volatility till the end of the month was to the downside. But um, that, that has a lot more to do with uh, cascading effect, tax loss selling, uh, a lot of technical factors on top of the real fundamental backdrop of those, those headwinds around China and the Fed, trade war and the Fed. So... Do I believe that the volatility level in 2019 will look more like 2017 or 2018? I think it'll look more like 2018, not 17. But I think every year looks more like 2018 than 2017. And to the degree that 2018 did anything constructive from my mindset as an asset allocator and a professional investment manager, I am pleased that it reminded investors that there's no free ride in being a risk asset investor. The risk premium that we command in, in our uh, investments, it, it, we, the price we pay for it is higher volatility of return. And we were not getting that higher volatility return in 2017 and a lot of 2016 as well. Um, and 2016 was certainly more volatile than 17, but... All that to say that uh, 2019, I certainly hope it will not be December levels of volatility and December levels of drawdown, but I don't uh, expect it to be a free ride. Now, let's talk about 2019 and and uh, then get ready to con offer a few concluding thoughts. Um, listen, the, the fact of the matter is that it is all about the Fed and... 
that when I say that, I don't merely mean if the Fed cuts rates, everything will be great, and if the Fed raises rates, everything will be bad. Uh, if the Fed were to go cut rates right now, I actually think that would be very negative in the sense that it would signal to the market that the Fed's panicking, that they see something that is not really good. The Fed needed to get to a more neutral rate so that they had some ammunition built up so that should there be some sort of economic slowdown, they would feel that they had a policy tool available to affect stimulus into the economy. And if the Fed was stuck down at zero and 1% rates, they wouldn't have that tool. It's debatable if they have it now, but at least they have a positive real rate for the first time since the financial crisis, as we sit here at about a 250 basis point Fed funds rate. Would I like to see that over 3% next time the Fed needs to actually cut? I would, but I don't think the Fed now is able to do it. They have The market has sort of scared them into, into place. But when I say it's all about the Fed, and what I mean by 2019 is the issue I brought up before about the liquidity in the corporate economy, that the access to credit as we go forward and the perception of access to credit is going to be a huge factor. <clears throat> High yield bond spreads don't mean a lot to me in terms of my direct investments because we're very, we have a very teeny tiny allocation throughout the assets we manage into the high yield bond market right now. But what they mean a lot about is in indicating to us the access to credit in the economy are businesses that are used to having um, access to credit and, and a sort of liquidity engine um, lubricated up for them. Are they being cut off from credit markets or is there this continuing flow of capital that's necessary in the particular innings we're in in this economic expansion? If the Fed were to continue expanding at the same rate they've been, uh, the, excuse me, if they were to continue drawing down their balance sheet, unwinding all of that liquidity they put into the economy post-financial crisis, then I believe it would be a very bearish thing into the market. But on the other hand, if the Fed is to slow it down and we were to see signals in the levered loan bank market, the levered bank loan market, the um, high yield spreads, that there is this continued flow of capital and that companies can borrow at a lower rate than the return on invested capital, it continues to provide the engine of economic productivity. But if the borrowing cost and the constriction of capital were such that it put the return on invested capital beneath that, I think that becomes very, very bearish. And that's what we're mostly watching. It's all about the Fed because it's all about the credit market. And that is a byproduct of what they created. They created a very lubricated liquidity in the global economy and to undo that, I think, becomes very problematic. So we have to monitor that in 2019, and it is a binary deal. It could be a big headwind or it could be a big tailwind, but I don't see any scenario where it becomes really neutral. Um, incidentally, the Fed is right now in the Fed futures market. It is showing, the market is saying that they do not believe the Fed will raise rates once all year. The Fed is still saying they plan to raise rates twice. There's even a small chance priced in the market, and not super small, it's 15 to 20 percent, saying that they think the Fed may cut rates once this year. But there's practically a zero percent probability implied in the federal funds futures of any rate hike at all this year. So the market at least is telling you right now the Fed's going to stay flat all year. Um, Brings me to our second theme, very much, it's really not a new theme because I've been talking about it for months and months, but it correlates to the first about credit markets, corporate confidence, the CapEx, capital expenditures, business investment. Um, we don't believe that the economic expansion can continue. Um, it would be long in the tooth as wages keep growing unless there was an enhancement to productivity. Productivity would, draw, would drive revenues higher. It would drive um, 
uh, profits higher, but it would hold unit labor costs flat, basically, because we'd be getting, even though we're paying more for labor, we'd be getting more out of it. You follow me? So you have this enhanced productivity, and that enhanced productivity, I believe, has to come from an enhanced capital expenditure, more R&D, more technology spend, um, more plants and factories, and, and just basic spending towards the investment of the business. Uh, that is something that was happening in spades in the Trump administration. You had dramatic capital expenditure growth, business investment growth, particularly in the first and second quarter of 2018. It completely came to a halt in the third quarter. We're waiting to get our fourth quarter numbers in GDP. I don't expect it to be pretty in this category. And I think a lot of that has to do with the headwind of the trade war. And so we'll see how that plays itself out. Um, we are very bullish in 2019 on emerging markets. Now, a lot of people may say you're bullish on emerging markets every year. Uh, and it is true that from a long-term standpoint of, of growth that can be bought at a reasonable price, we do really have a very um, bullish view on, on how the emerging markets asset class will play out over time. And we define the emerging markets asset class as equities, of companies in uh, third world emerging market territories that have this really uh, uh, great business revenue growth serving a domestic economy uh, that has a high uh, uh, return on invested capital, a high return on equity, and yet a very low um, capex need, uh, a very low um, uh, what's what's the right way to kind of explain this? A low valuation, price earnings, price book, price of sales, all the metrics that when you buy growth in the United States, you have to pay up. You have to pay a very high P.E. ratio to buy a fast growing company. That's not true in a lot of emerging markets. So it becomes a great value play to buy the high growth of emerging markets right now trading at about 10 times earnings, even as the U.S. is trading at 14 times earnings. And yet, the risk we take on is currency risk. If the dollar continues escalating, it hurts the currencies in a lot of cases of emerging economies. And also geopolitical risk. These, uh, a lot of the countries themselves are not exactly you know, case studies for functional government. Um, but that risk premium is, fact, is priced into what it is the opportunity set is in that asset class. Uh, I, I have a chart in our in our paper on the last, I think it's about 10 different bear markets that have taken place in emerging markets and what the return has been one year later and two years later. The bounce back in emerging markets tends to be very dramatic, very consistent, very dependable, and we believe it's going to happen here as well. And so we're very bullish in the space. We think things have become kind of bottoming out at the end of the third quarter last year. And, and that the relative outperformance already kicked in, and then now we expect there to be a better repricing. What could make that go wrong? Well, certainly the Fed shocking markets with even more tightening that would rally the dollar and pull back the emerging economies or the trade war worsening and the perception that maybe a lot of these, these countries are hitting a huge you know, uh, roadblock in their sales growth could be very problematic, but we don't anticipate those things happening, and we think emerging markets will be a great beneficiary. But with that said, we, we, we also are, are very bullish on the alternative investment world. And I spoke about how well that did for us at the Bonson Group in 2018, but that theme is not in any way, shape, or form coming down. And a lot of people say, oh, are you increasing alternatives because you're getting more bearish on equities? That's not the case. We're very neutral on equities, if you were looking for just kind of a three sentence summary, what do you think of the three major asset classes in 2018? We're kind of even weight in equities, a little underweight in bonds, and a little overweight in alternatives. So the fact of the matter is, our heavier view into alternatives is more about our view of the bond market than anything else. We're never going to say, let's not own bonds. The fact of the matter is that people saying, oh, interest rates are so low, bonds are going to go down. They've been saying it forever. It's year after year after year, and, they, and the bond market continues to eke out positive returns. There's a reason for that. 
There are various long-term secular dynamics going on right now, and the long bond yield has been very stubborn. And the long bond yield responds to the short bond yield that the Fed left at 0% for basically a decade. And so it forced a new paradigm of of lower long-term bond yields and all of a sudden break away and say, oh, the 10-year Treasury is going back to 4.5%. The idea that's going to happen overnight is insane. And so I think that the bond market becomes a place to diversify deflationary or recessionary concerns in the economy and the stock market to the extent those concerns don't surface The risk assets are going to give you a lot of your return. The bond market may putter around, but it's a needed diversifier for a balanced investor. The alternative space enables us to replace some of the risks of the the secular factors in stock and bond markets with um, altogether different risk. It, It brings down our beta, our direct market correlation, And we take on the risk of our manager executing, of our manager producing good results, of of the chosen strategy of finding mispriced securities and relative value arbitrage working. There's a risk in that, but it's a risk we're willing to take to help diversify away some of those other risks. So we like the heavier focus on alternatives. Well, alternatives have a very hard time standing out when everything in the world's going up. So you talk about a 2017 environment where everything was going higher, as I alluded to earlier, it was not as standout-ish for alternatives. You talk about a 2018 where everything was going down, it was very standout-ish for alternatives. You get more dispersion of results, maybe some asset classes up, some down in 2019. It gives you an opportunity for alternatives to stand out. Best of breed managers delivering a lot of alpha. That's our view into 2019, so we're overweight into the hedge funds and some of our alternative asset uh, investments. Uh, We are negative on housing in 2019. It would be really difficult to justify not being um, there. uh, And it has a lot to do with our view on any asset class that has a rising price of money. To the extent rates go higher and an asset class relies on borrowed money, then the price of money has gone out higher and it brings down the value of the underlying asset class. It's just math and economics. Um, but you also did have a really substantial run that put things at, I believe, a stretched valuation. We do not believe there will be a housing crash nationally or even in given local markets. We believe there will be a kind of healthy correction that will end up voting well. You're going to hear all the talk all year about, oh, no, things are bad in the economy because housing is slowing down. Our view is, oh, yes, things are going to be good in the economy because housing is slowing down because it will enable a more efficient allocation of capital if you get a right-sized, right-priced, right-valued housing sector that can then reallocate that uh, capital into healthier forms of production and consumption. Uh, affordability is not a negative, as in our view. So um, if you're, that, that's our view on the broad housing market, and obviously it has a high local dimension to it as well. Um, the energy story is one that has required a lot of patience to the extent people are looking for big escalating stock prices. And I don't know that that's going to change this year. I do think we've already this year seen a really healthy repricing in the midstream sector. Uh, when I say healthy repricing, it's up double digits already this year. And I have no intention of selling any of our exposure there for quite some time. I think it's not, it wasn't just 10 to 15% undervalued, it's 30 to 40% undervalued. But we have um, no forecast for you as to when the prices of oil and gas pipelines and energy infrastructure will reflect the real story playing out. What we do have is an incredibly high and attractive current cash flow, high yield, high spread of yield over the bond market that is being achieved, that has been achieved through this whole period of time, high yield and high growing yield that frankly will continue into 2019 as more service projects go online. And um, we think that you uh, see that kind of um, 
stabilization in a sector that has lacked it. Now, people say, well, what's oil prices going to do? That's not the way we'd be invested into it. Oil has also moved up dramatically in the early part of 2019 already. It was up most of 2018. It crashed hard at the end of 2018, as so many other things did. But we do believe that somewhere between $55 and $75 oil is much more likely than between $40 and $50 oil based on supply-demand factors and based on the geopolitical reality of what level of oil prices OPEC countries need to see to fit a lot of their other agendas. Um, so we like the energy story, and then the market has not liked it for a while, and that makes us like it more, but we think it requires patience. And I am very glad to say that while we have to exert that patience, we get paid handsomely through the form of the dividend and cash distributions. The, the final theme of 2019 I'll share with you, give you something to think about that, that dovetails into a broader message is deja vu all over again, the place we find ourselves in 2019 and how eerily similar it is to where we found ourselves entering 2016 and where we found ourselves near the end of 1998. It goes back in time a bit. Um, 1998 first. Tell me if any of this sounds familiar to you. And I already gave away the, the conclusion. GDP growth is growing. Unemployment is very low. Uh, the stock market has come off some really, really solid years. Um, there's a real concern of global slowdown. And uh, the stock market now has started to reverse. And there's a concern that that may mean that the overall economy were to slow down. So to keep the wheels turning, uh, the Fed stimulated dramatically. Almost all of that story is, is identical to where we find ourselves now. You had an emerging markets hiccup around the Russian ruble in uh, August of 1998. There was this massive U.S. hedge fund called Long-Term Capital Management that imploded. And the market went down 22% in a month. And then it closed the year up uh, on the year um, through growing GDP, low unemployment, the Fed was actually cutting rates. Um, the, the fast forward to late 2015 coming into early 2016, where we were exactly three years ago now, in January of 16, the market was tanking. This year it was December of 18. Oil prices were collapsing. Everyone was really worried about a slowdown in China, and everyone was really worried, as the Fed was saying, they had a lot of tightening to do in front of them. What happened through 2016? The Fed didn't tighten at all. Oil prices uh, stabilized and, in fact, corrected. And the China issues got far, far better than people expected behind a lot of synchronized policy. Uh, will 2019 play out exactly how 2016 did? I don't know. I, I, I think it's very possible. It won't be exactly the same. And no year is ever exactly the same as another but when I look at the mentality, when I look at the macroeconomic conditions, and when I look at the things people are worried about that are not present now, that are similar to the paradigm of early 16 and of late 98, that's the deja vu feeling I get. Um, I don't believe the Fed is capable of saying, hey, risk assets be damned, we don't care. I believe that they uh, are afraid of the market telling them they're getting something wrong. And that's what took place, and, and there's plenty of other precedents besides 98 and 2016 of that. But I think ultimately um, the, the, the China issues, the overall global slowdown, the, the dollar getting ahead of itself, retreating, I think that's what you're going to see in 2019. Now, do I have 100% conviction that it's all systems go this year? I do not. I know we're in late innings of a cycle in both business expansion and a stock bull market. So if anything, I'm grateful that we got a chance to buy assets at lower prices after the December correction. But I think you want heavier alternative weighting in 2019. And I think you want to keep your equity positions in line with what is the suitable asset allocation for your own um, profile as an investor. Because those headwinds are still very real. They haven't gone away. 
but I don't think people want to pull back and become hyper defensive, come to cash and then say, I plan to come back in once markets have corrected 15, 20%. It's insane to me. So the right response for us is to be able to have a certain kind of squishy middle where we pull back but stay properly exposed, focus on bottom-up quality, play the rotation from growth to value. If we want more octane and juice, play emerging markets and allow good fundamentals to recapture their valuation in the energy sector and financials and in the overall dividend growth names that we believe in so much. I think it's the right posture for someone to be equity neutral, slightly underweight bonds, overweight alternatives, focus in energy, focus in alternatives, and expect that the Fed will not end up being your enemy this year, but how much they'll be your friend remains to be seen. Those last few sentences is pretty much, you could have just fast forwarded right to the end of this and, and gotten the whole bottom line. I'm going to leave it there. I know it's been a lot. There's a long video and long podcast, and I appreciate you listening and viewing through it. We really hope you'll get a copy of our white paper, read through the materials in there, send it out to whoever you'd like. Um, It's something that I feel really accurately captures our viewpoint as we enter 2019. And speaking of entering 2019, I wish you and yours a very happy new year. We cannot wait for what the year uh, has in store. And we encourage you to reach out to us anytime, any questions. Thanks again.